Hey everybody, welcome back. Um, in this video we're going to be talking about proxy data. You might, um, maybe you've heard the term proxy. One of the ways we might hear about a proxy, or at least hear that term used, is actually political. In a sense that oftentimes if you're not able to go make a vote for a particular, um, you know, particular issue, you might send someone in your place and give them your proxy vote. Meaning, you voted, but you didn't actually vote. You didn't do the voting, someone else did it. So if we think about what the term proxy means, in that case, the previous example, I would be giving the authority of my vote to someone else, right? So the vote would actually be coming from someone else. In the sciences, when we use the word proxy, we're actually using, we're collecting data that has the authority to represent something else. So in the case of climate, and especially when we think about climate, you know, in Earth's past, we can't go and measure it. We can't go and stick a thermometer kind of up in the air someday 700 years ago, right? That, that chance is gone. So what we need to do is we need to find something that we can measure that correlates to temperature in that, in that example. Uh, and so what that would be is that would be what we would call a proxy, something you can measure that correlates to the thing that you're actually really interested in. Um, and there are actually quite a few different proxies that we use to establish climate science, um, but let's, let's stop for a second and think about why we have to use them. When we think about climate, climate is, we, we talked about this earlier, really a couple of things, right? It's basically you know, temperature and precipitation and all the different kind of variations thereof. Um, and we measure those, right? We measure those with instruments, right? We have um, you know, a way to measure precipitation. We have a, measure, a way to measure all sorts of different variables in the current climate, um, particularly temperature. And that is what we call the instrumental record. Those are direct measurements of the climate. Um, and the instrumental record is, you know, we've been able to measure temperature for quite a while. But really, when we started systematically measuring temperature, measuring it every day, keeping track of all of these kind of, um, you know, climate observations or observations of weather, you know, what, what was going on that particular day, that really doesn't go back much farther than the late 1800s. So a good date to keep in mind for the beginning of what we would call the instrumental record is about 1880. Um, it's not the same in every location, as you can imagine, like big cities and research, research institutions started measuring temperature earlier. Um, I think in Boise, our rigorous temperature record goes back to about 1890. So we were a little, a little late, but still late 1800s. Everything since then, we have very rigorous temperature records and everything prior to that, we don't, right? We might have spotty measurements that were made in a kind of inconsistent or a way that's not able to be um, replicated or in some cases even known. Trying to figure out what the climate was doing prior to this requires, as you can imagine, a little bit of um, magic in a sense. And again, it goes back to this idea of proxy where you can find a variable that you can measure that actually correlates to a variable that you can't measure. Um, so for that to be possible, we have to have a very well-known relationship between those two things, meaning those records have to overlap, right? So, um, you know, if we have instrumental record going back to 1880, we can find some proxy, and we'll talk about what some of those things are here in a second, that has significant overlap. And what we can then do is we can establish how closely those are related um, and what the nature of that relationship is. And then once we've got that established, we can then leave this realm and go past the instrumental record looking at this one particular variable, but now we have an established relationship of how it measures back to, in this case, temperature. So climate affects the earth. And as it affects the earth, things respond to climate. Those are the sorts of things that we focus on as proxy or proxy data. You know, a really good example is trees, right? So tree rings. We've all kind of learned how, you know, every, every year a tree is growing really fast for part of the year and it's making these really large cells, you know, tree cells of uh, cellulose and then 
when it starts to cool off, that tree slows down. It's growing. Those cells get really, really, really small um, until that tree goes essentially dormant. And then in the springtime, that tree starts growing rapidly again, and so the cells spread out. So if you look at a slab of wood, or what we would call a tree cookie, you can see that pattern, right? You can see the large cells and the narrow cells, and that's what we call an annual growth ring. Now, the growth that happened that year is a function of climate, right? And so we can look at the spacing of those rings, um, and we can use that to correlate, well, how did the climate how was the climate behaving in that year that led to a tree ring of a certain width? Um, and actually, this is really robust data because it turns out trees are everywhere. Um, and many of them are, you know, have, have significant overlap with the modern world, right? And so we can actually look at tree ring spacing versus measured climate history, come up with a relationship, and then we can look at tree rings that go beyond that. So the... Um, what we call the dendro, the dendrochronology, or the dendroclimatology, dendro meaning tree, um, that record spans about 15,000 years, um, going back you know, to the, some of the oldest trees, like the oldest living tree, I think is bristlecone pine, it's about 5,000 years old, they're down in Nevada, you can go and hike and, and take a look. Um, but then we can also take that record and compare it to trees that are no longer living, right? Like a, like a log or something like that. And we can push the record even further back into what we call a master chronology. Um, so tree rings are, are pretty good at this. Another proxy data that we can use is the relationship between fossil leaves and stomata, which are little cells in the back of the leaves that allow for uh, photosynthesis and cellular respiration in plants. Um, and what we've been able to establish is that there's a strong relationship with the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and the density of stomata cells. This, this type of proxy data is great, um, but it's, it's failing is that we don't have like perfect records for every year, right? You don't just find a fossil that you can establish within a specific year. But especially when we're going deeper time, like going back maybe a million years, um, we can use this to get a glimpse at what the CO2 concentrations were. We're not, we're not going to have a perfect record of you know, tree leaf fossils for every specific year, um, but we will get these kind of glimpses into the past. Um, coral. Coral is another uh, climate proxy that we can use, and corals grow fairly slowly, but when they do, they're growing in the ocean, and so they're interacting with seawater. Um, and there's a couple of different things we can pull out of corals. Um, particularly um, oxygen isotopes, which tell us some things about temperature. Um, but also we can look at CO2 content and corals give us some idea of ocean chemistry, um, kind of larger than just oxygen isotopes. Um, another thing that we can look at for proxy data is seafloor sediments, right? So the ocean is basically covered with mud, if you wanted to think about it that way. And we drive a boat out and send a little kind of plunger down, it's got a suction, you know, this little metal thing drops into the mud, applies a suction, and we pull up a chunk of seafloor core of mud, very tightly packed mud. Um, and that can tell us actually quite a bit. We can look at the different types of materials that were deposited and figure out sedimentation rates, which is largely tied to precipitation. Um, and then on top of that, we can actually pull out of the mud little tiny critters um, the kind of most famous of which being uh, foraminifera, or what we call forams. Um, they're these light, little tiny shelled creatures. And as they're deposited in this kind of vertical sense, re remember in, in kind of geology or geosciences, that stacking order is time, right? Because it takes time as these sediments are laid out. We can actually see how the chemistry in the shells of those little critters changes over time. So that's another great um, proxy. It also So that brings us to the big one, right? Uh, when we think about climate science and client proxies, there's really just one and it's ice ice baby, right? <laughs> yeah, so ice is an incredible climate proxy for multiple reasons. Um, but to really get into that, we have to understand, first of all, how ice forms. Uh, well, I've drawn some, drawn some little snowflakes here. 
When we think about ice, what we're really kind of considering is what we call glacial ice. This is ice that was you know, not formed on the surface of a lake or a river, um, but ice that was formed essentially by the stacking of other snow particles, right? So ice that was formed under pressure. Um, for that to happen or for you to have a, an environment where that can form, the, the biggest factor that needs to be present is that it needs to snow more on an annual basis than it melts. And in that case, you would have a surplus of snow, right? So let's say it snows 10 feet every year in a particular location, but only six or seven feet of that melt in any given year, meaning there's a few more, few more feet piled on every year. 10 feet of snow is being pretty generous, but that's applicable in some areas, particularly high mountain areas. Um, when we think about a place like Greenland or Antarctica, um, and if you think back to your polar cells, right, those polar cells are bringing dry air into the polar regions, they are, by all technical definitions, a desert, right? There's very little precipitation in Antarctica or in Greenland, um, but there's also very little melt that occurs there. So we have ice records that go back incredibly far. So when we think about a place like Antarctica, right, that's really where our kind of good ice proxies are gonna come from, our temperature proxies, um, because the snow has been forming for a very long time. So I wanted to go back to this diagram and talk about it just a little bit more. So as snowflakes fall down, they begin to pile up. It snows, snowpocalypse, right? We can all remember that. Um, but those snowflakes also contain a lot of air, right? There's air, and then as they pile up, there's air between the particles. Um, but if the snow continues to pile up and continues to pile, well, snow is heavy, right? Um, it's water, it's, it's fairly dense. And actually, if you remember, you know, in a big snow year, you might have to go shovel the snow off of a building or something or, a, you know, a, a patio cover so that it doesn't collapse. Um, here, as that snow builds up, it just starts squishing everything below it um, to greater and greater and greater extent. And eventually, um, just kind of an, an, an average number is when that gets to about 150 feet of snow, um, so 50 meters, when it gets we've got 50 meters thick or about 150 feet of snow, that's enough pressure to actually force those molecules to undergo what in geology we would call metamorphosis. Um, but those snow grains, their, their water crystals will grow into their neighbors under those pressures and they'll form one big block of ice. Um, but there's a whole bunch of gases trapped. Um, so further down, all of those spaces that were initially kind of the atmosphere that was trapped in between all these snow particles that were sitting here, those are now air bubbles in this one composite solid piece of ice. That is going to allow us to make some pretty cool proxy measurements um, and actually even some direct measurements. So when we look at glacial ice, um, I've got here, this is, a, this is a chunk of a glacier. This is from the Sipple Dome complex, I think, in Antarctica. This is about a 50,000 year old piece of ice. And when you look at it, the most striking thing is that it's full of gas bubbles. Those gas bubbles are a time machine, right? They actually are the atmosphere from 50,000 years ago. I talked to some of these researchers and they always say like, well, if you've got to drill a certain depth, you, you go a little bit further and you use it to make gin and tonics, right? It's kind of a standard thing. Um, so I'm actually going to stop the video here because now that we understand glacial ice and how it forms these little gas bubbles, I want to get into what we can learn from those gas bubbles and what the data looks like. Um, so just to kind of circle back, we talked about proxies, climate proxies things that you can measure that you can correlate to temperature 